All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bethany, West Seattle. We're so glad that everyone's here, even as a small community. We're just happy to be together and worship together this morning and spend time together in God's presence. Um, I just want to invite everybody to stand up as we sing together the first song. Let's invite God to speak to our hearts this morning. song Waymaker. Um, let's let this song just be a meditation upon who God is and also a proclamation. One thing, one line I really like in this song is, <clears throat> let's see, it's in the bridge where they say, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. And I like that it doesn't necessarily require us to feel God, even though it's nice to feel God, but it doesn't require us to feel God to, um, to know that he's still with us and still working. All right, Waymaker. I worship. 
that first verse again. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. Good morning, Bethany, West Seattle. Um, you can take a seat, too. Um, I am Hannah. I'm the Connection Coordinator here, and it's good to see all of you this morning, as well as those of you joining us online. Um, thanks for being here. And I have a couple of announcements for our community, um, and so... One of them is that we are having a outdoor day, sort of um, just a time to connect with each other, connect with nature outside, and that's gonna be August 27th. 
and that is at Canasket Palmer State Park. There's also a camping option that day. So if you just wanna come out for the day with your family, that's awesome. If you wanna spend the night and you're interested in camping with us, um, let us know. There's registration online on the link tree as well as you can um, catch me in the back after service to get more info. Um, if you are new with us or if you'd like to get plugged in, learn about our church um, and how you, know, you can find out about ministries and giving opportunities and all of that good stuff is on the link tree. So that is that link up there. There's also a QR code in the back. Um, at this time, kids can go meet your teachers in the back, Teacher Cam and Teacher Esther, um, and you'll have a great time downstairs. Um, and then I am going to invite all of us to stand up and greet one another um, in a time of fellowship. All right. Well, good to connect for a minute. Um, welcome. Bethany was say, I feel like we should be like sitting in chairs or something. This feels like overly formal for a small group of us. But my name's Scott. Um, I mostly work at Bethany North uh, on Sundays and then kind of Monday through Monday through Friday, uh, my role as senior pastor is working with all six of our locations. And I haven't been here with Seattle. We had a staff day uh, that Hannah and Prentice and others put on um, in the spring where we spent some time worshiping and praying here. And then we went to the Duwamish Center and did our kind of an on or offsite there all day. It was really special. I haven't been here for worship for some time. And I was saying to Caitlin earlier, the last time I was here with my wife, we just looked around and we're like, this is a cool church. Like, if we lived in this neighborhood, this would be a place we'd want to come. We could just tell there's a great vibe. And I know summer, lots of people are gone, traveling, whatever. And Prentice is out. He'll be back in a couple weeks. But it's a joy to be here, actually, um, and uh, continue our parable series. Um, so I bring, I bring greetings from the mothership, from all Bethany. And please know, you might be geographically... Uh, you know, one of the corners, but very much, uh, Bethany Masiela, you're, you're in the heart of our leadership. We love what, what God's doing here. And I will tell you, before we start, it's like, is this the preamble to the sermon? This might be a very long Sunday. This is the preamble. And yeah, we got all morning, so buckle up. No. Uh, <laughs> What God has assembled as a staff at Bethany West Seattle come like mid-September is pretty remarkable between Taylor and Prentice, Hannah, um, and then uh, your new employee. Like I look at the, what the staff and then the lay people that are here, I feel like God's equipping this group for, for multiplication in the season ahead and for good news in this neighborhood. So I get the joy today to wrap this series up. We've been in a six-week series. I don't know if you've been able to track it much. You know, summer's going to be so busy. We've been teaching the parables, and the parables, this was a series, uh, one of the things that Bethany does, I think really well, I'm really proud of this legacy, it was built by my predecessor, so I just inherited it, we've tweaked it some, but every Monday, well in the summer, it's Tuesdays, we gather as what's called teaching team, and that's the six location pastors from Bethany's six locations, and then another about eight or nine people, these are women and men, these are white and brown, some younger, some older, um, just a neat group of people, and we study the Bible together, and then we write our sermons together, and we also are dreaming about the future together through the sermon series. So this sermon series was actually built by uh, Lydia Choi, who's the associate pastor of Bethany North, and then Silas Sham, who's the associate pastor of Bethany Northeast, about studying the parables, but through an ethos of relationship. And I don't know if that's come through uh, in the weeks you've been listening to the message, but our heart was that the parables are stories. Stories are life-changing, and life-changing in the sense of restoring what I feel really is our big mission statement right now, is restoring relationship to God and to others. To me, it's really simple. Like, let's go back to our first love. We've got to get back to kind of the core mission of the church, really falling in love with God again and experiencing his love, and then that's got to be transformational in our horizontal relationships. And like you, I've experienced during COVID, our small group fell apart, and I see fragmentation in the church and in our neighborhood, and you know, there's just enough of the bad news stories. We don't have to necessarily repeat them, but we need the good news of God to be rebuilding our faith in Him and rebuilding our relationships one to another. How do we, how do we do faith in our lives again, in our jobs, in our churches? So today is the final message. Starting next week, I believe Taylor is preaching. Oh no, I think uh, our. Um, our uh, 
uh, Kendi Easley and her, her role as executive pastor. I think she's going to be out here next weekend with you guys. Um, but the series is going to be on First Peter and kind of a four-week series on First Peter, a, a series about what is God's heart for uh, his people. But I get to wrap up our series today. We have a parable coming out of Luke 18. You can follow along in your Bibles or on your phones or just listen in. This is a parable of the persistent widow, sometimes called the parable of the unjust judge. This is Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. I'll read it to you. We'll pray and dive in. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Jesus said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally, he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day at night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let me pray and we'll dive in. Jesus, thank you so much for this odd but powerful story. And God, we would just ask that through this story, these old words, this old message, you would make it new again, that you would open up our eyes and ears and mostly our hearts, that God, you would give us over to the renewing of our mind, but also the experiences of our bodies and our hearts, that we'd be embodied people. God, what does this story have to say into our story? What does this parable mean for us, the people of God, living here in Seattle in 2022, what do you want to do with this message today, God? Open us up. We ask, we beg, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, um, this is an unusual story. Um, it's an unusual parable. Many of the parables are unusual, but this is a really odd one because it tells the message before even the story. Most of the parables, if you look through all of Jesus' parables, most of the meaning of the parables is fairly open to interpretation. Or Jesus leaves his listeners with like, hey, here's what I think you should do with it, but I'm going to give you an interpretation. This is a different one. This is Jesus like, hey, here's the punchline before the story even comes. I used to teach high school English. Before that, I worked in Hollywood. I worked for Trimark Pictures. I was doing script coverage. I was working in the publicity department. I love films. I love stories. I just finished the book. I was at a soccer tournament and got into Where the Crawdads Sing and just page turner, right? Uh, how many of you have not read Where the Crawdads Sing? Okay, I'm going to tell you how it ends right now because it's this incredible ending. At the end, the protagonist, you, like there's a, I'm, I wouldn't do that, right? Because you, like, I, Gunner's like, I don't care. I'm not going to read the book or see the movie. But the point of story is the unfolding. The point of like, okay, we're going to go to a film. It's if you know exactly how it ends, it doesn't mean as much. And normally, Jesus is tracking right there. He, he tells stories more than gives sermon. Gives a sermon on the mount, greatest sermon ever given. But most of Jesus' public ministry for three years was a ministry of story, a ministry of certainly justice and doing the right thing and setting people free. But when people handed him a microphone, more often than not, Jesus said, I'm going to tell you a story because stories captivate and we can find ourselves in story. But this one is different because she's like, I so want you to get the message that before I even go into the story, I'm going to give you the punchline. And like any of these stories, like what do they matter for us? What do they matter for JP? What does this story mean for your life tomorrow morning when you get up and fix breakfast for your son or go to work or do, you know, like these stories have to matter to our stories. And, and why Jesus, why did he want us to know the exact point? His punchline, if you look there in Luke 18, verse 1, pray and don't lose heart. Keep the faith. Well, he ends with a question. It's a haunting question. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? And you kind of imagine Jesus like looking at his listeners and just posing that question. That Jesus is giving this deeply encouraging message to, to pray a certain way, to act a certain way, to believe a certain way. It's like Jesus is kind of giving, you know, this like rousing speech, like we've got to keep the faith, friends. 
I'm not exactly sure. Some scholars say because in Luke 17, Jesus has been talking about the kingdom of God in such a way that maybe his closest followers were getting discouraged. Like, how are we going to actually do this? And more and more by Luke 18, Jesus had been talking about the end and that he was going to his father and his disciples may have been confused. But this story, Jesus says, is this great encouragement to keep praying and to keep acting justly. And this intersection of prayer and justice is what faith is. Jewish people, scholars believe in this day and age, believe that you could wear out God by over praying. The Jewish scholars took from the story of Daniel, Daniel 6.10, that says, now when Daniel learned the decree had been published against the Jewish people, Daniel went home to his upstairs room and the windows were open towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God. So most Pharisees and, and scholars in Jesus' day said that was the model. You could only pray three times a day, face Jerusalem, and we don't want to wear God out. They thought that this father could be taxed somehow or tormented by the prayers of the people. And so Jesus gives this message today, this story, to say, that's not the father that you follow. You can't wear him out. He's not an unjust judge. He's so different than this. And Jesus does this kind of characterization of contrast in this story to say, our father is not like this judge, and we should be like this woman. I know you've heard this before, but I, it just bears repeating like how counterculture it is that Jesus makes the heroine of the story this woman, a, a marginalized woman as a widow in first century Jerusalem, a woman who has lost everything, but Jesus says, I want you all who may be facing discouragement to be like her. I want, to, I want you to be like her. And the big thing that we're going to kind of unpack today is, I, I hope this is really encouraging to you. I, I, like you, I need encouragement in my faith. There's more days than not, there's more discouragement than encouragement. I'm, man, I, I heard somebody say recently, like, we've lost a lot, but we've gained some other things. And I'm, I'm hungry for that perspective right now. I, I don't mind naming the things we've lost, but I just feel like we keep doing that, and the losses have been many. I'm also hungry for hope. I don't know about you. I'm hungry for hope. What, what, are, what have we learned? Where do we go from here over these last couple of years? That yes, fragmentation and relational distress and on and on and on. But Jesus says, I want you to pray and I want you to act and I want you to believe that there's a good God who's moving in this world. And, and so uh, one of the things that I really love about yearly Pastor Prentice is he's always pressing into what he calls the T-dub. I don't know if this is like over it. I don't hope I'm not blowing his tactics here or whatever, but when we study his teaching team, he's always like, man, what's the tweetable statement? Like, what is the, like, when your people go out of your, of your sanctuaries, what are they actually going to hold on to? And I think it's really powerful because when we hear, when we come together, when we come to sing and pray and, and hear the scriptures taught, it's, it's meant that our lives would be changed and impacted. And so my big hope for us today is that through this story of Jesus, that we would come to believe and really believe that faith, real faith, the faith that we need to rebuild our hope in, faith is the act of praying and practicing justice that changes the lives of others and changes us. That's what real faith is. It's, we're, we're called to pray. We're called to act. Both of those, Jesus dovetails, this is what faith is. And if you allow it, says Jesus, it'll change your life. And I honestly believe it'll change, our, it'll change our city. And I don't know about you, but last night, landing at SeaTac, driving through our city, I'm like, man, I love this place. And it also needs a heart change. It needs a move of God. Because I'm driving and seeing the sunset of the Olympics. I don't know if you caught it last night. It was insane. Crescent moon. Unreal. So much. Man, Mariners won ninth inning over the Astros. Life is good. And then, you know, there's tents. There's people living out. I'm just like, man, we live in such paradox. Where does our hope come from? Jesus wants to bring to bear hope. It's prayer and justice that becomes faith. So our outline is going to be pretty simple. We're going to look at prayer. We're going to look at justice. We're going to look at faith. We're going to do it over the next 27 minutes, I promise you. But 
Let's look at prayer. Uh, this was the punchline again, Luke 18, verse 1. Jesus gave them the story in order that they would pray and never see some prayer. We're called to petition and pray, especially when things are difficult. If you look at verse uh, 1 through 4 of chapter 18, Jesus told his disciples this parable to show, always pray and not give up. And then he tells the story. Certain town, there was a judge. He didn't fear God. He didn't care what people thought. And then there's a widow. Jesus said, he's a masterful storyteller. He gives us the characters. And the widow is kept, keeps coming to the unjust judge. Grant me justice against my adversary. So it bears repeating because we dive into the exegesis and the unpacking of the narrative that Jesus gave us the punchline. The story is meant for you to always pray and never give up. And like I mentioned in the introduction, chapter 17, when Jesus is teaching on the kingdom of God, it's more than likely the disciples have become quite discouraged by what they feel like is this countercultural, upside-down kingdom that Jesus came, not to establish them as the ones that never hurt, but to establish them the one that always pray, especially when they hurt. So it's Jesus saying, this is what prayer is. It's, it's pleading with God. It's presence with God. And it's really important for me, kind of core theology. We haven't spent a lot of time together, but if we did, you would know that one of the core theology things for me is that it becomes really paramount for us as Christians in this city right now to believe there are no delusions. Christianity is not a get-out-of-jail-free card. We don't get to, like, not hurt because of Christ. Personally, my theology was impacted when, you know, 12, 13 years ago now, we lost a full-term baby boy, Fisher Samuel. So I have two older kids, we have our son who we lost, and then we have two younger kids. So part of our family narrative is that pain happens, loss happens, and faith can still be had. And so here is this woman who models, especially in difficult times, we're meant to increase our prayer, not decrease it. She was a widow who is suffering unjustly from her adversary. We don't know what's going on, but she's kind of like twice marginalized in the story. And in the way that Jesus just does, she's an unlikely hero because she continues to plead. She continues to believe in faith that this, just, this judge will do the right thing. And regretfully, and many Christians I know would just bear witness to this, like you can be this great Christian and still have a really difficult time in life. It's not a good out of jail free card. But Jesus asked that question at the end, but can we still have faith? Can we be like this woman? How? Remember, how? Verse 18. Pray. Keep praying. And I know like um, most faith communities, it's like, Let's, let's draw boundaries. Are we going to pray or are we going to act? Like, I, like this is, you know, this is kind of, I'm going to give the lay of the land at, you know, that church or like that group of Christians, whatever. It's like, are they the praying kind or are they the justice kind? We love delineations. We love to put people into kind of, you know, their own camps. And Jesus does this really unlikely and beautiful thing in this story that he says that like the justice that becomes real faith and, and this woman need to act, he anchors it in spiritual practice. He, he anchors it in prayer, in communication with God. He says that God will act. And keep in mind, God is not the judge. This judge neither fears God, you know, nor cares what people think. Like this guy, I'm going to talk about this judge in just a minute, but this judge is like lost all of his own identity and all of his own goodness. But it just can't be overstated enough for us when we're trying to like rebuild our lives and rebuild our churches to believe that prayer really matters, to rebuild our churches, to rebuild our friendships, to rebuild our romantic relationships, to rebuild purpose and identity. First Peter 3 says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayers. And so simply put, like this message is meant to encourage us that prayer changes us as we bring our pleadings before God, and God hears prayers. Prayer is communication, but there's no guarantee that it's always going to work out. So if we, just, if we need this kind of remembrance that prayer is communication with God, and I would love you to come up with something really practical from today's message, I've got six practical ways to pray. Because for, I talk to a lot of people, and even people are like, man, I come to church on Sunday, or I watch online, or I'm podcasting, or I'm like trying to live the life of faith. But prayer is hard for me, Scott. 
And I say, well, why? And they're like, well, because me and God are, we're just, we're not that tight right now. We're not that, you know, like, sometimes we want to believe that prayer comes out of the overflow of the perfect faith. This widow models that in the midst of our brokenness and our pain is when we increase our prayer, when we increase our pleading. It's like sometimes in a romantic relationship, it's like, man, things are so hard. How can we possibly go on a date? How would we possibly do an overnight? Or we're so busy that, you know, how can I, like something's changing between me and my romantic other. But it's like, particularly in that gap that we're called to increase our desire for participation. So many, you know, many of us, like this is review, but I was saying to my wife this morning, as I was like looking over the sermon, I was saying, both of us have learned more about prayer as communication and intimacy with God over the last two years. And it's been transformative for our marriage and for our relationship with Christ. So the church has practiced specific ways of praying for 2,000 years, and I do feel like we kind of need to like re- renew those practices and, and dust them off again. And for some of you, you're like, oh, that's overly legalistic. Then you just let that one go. But I should be able to, if you're like, hey, we're just meeting each other. Like, are you a Jesus follower? Me too. How are you praying right now? And like, not because like the pastor is holding people accountable. No, I'm just like, as we're just like people on the journey, uh, you know, how are we, like, how are you connecting to the life force that is Father God? So here's some different ways that I would just suggest. And maybe if you're open to it, if you're like, you know, I, I'm hungry for a deeper prayer life, maybe one of these will just pop for you. And maybe you'd want to try it over the month of August, where it's like, you know, August, I know it's busy with our camping and our traveling, whatever, but there's also some space that the good weather just allows. Maybe, just maybe, one of these would be something you'd be interested in kind of diving into. So the first ways that the church has used prayer to really build, rebuild faith is praying the hours. And there's a great app uh, that you have to Google because I'm blanking on the name right now. But you'll get a you know, reminder of four times a day on your phone, morning prayer, midday prayer, mid-afternoon prayer, evening prayer, praying the hours that either use an app or just setting a timer that during times of the day, set times four times a day, that you would stop even for a couple minutes and say, God, I'm aware of your presence. Help me become more aware of you. And for some of us, we pray maybe in the evening or we pray at church or pray at a meal or whatever. But what praying the hours does is it breaks every day an opportunity to be aware. Prayer is awareness. So that's one idea. Uh, the second idea about how do I rebuild my prayer life to real intimacy, maybe even in the month ahead. This is something Pastor Richard talks about all the time, uh, and he's still around preaching at Green Lake, and we had lunch this week. I'm super grateful for his role in my life, but he talks about coffee with God. And for Richard, his morning routine, and some people do it in the evening, but there is something about morning. You know, it's a pot of coffee, it's scriptures, and it's even 15 minutes before everything else happens to just pray and connect with God. A third way, this has been really helpful in my home over the last year or two, it's called the prayer of examen, or some people call it the prayer of examen. It's also called the Ignatian prayer. But this is a simple prayer practice, typically at the end of the day, particularly those of you with little kids can do this, highs and lows, your, your consolation, where did you experience God in the highs to, today, and desolation, where did you feel the absence of God? And when you pray that, especially with another person, a roommate or you know, husband or wife or somebody you're dating, this prayer of eximen allows spiritual intimacy to happen with somebody else in a very simple way, highs and lows, but bringing it before God and turning it to prayer. After you share the consolation, desolation, you just pray God into that because we're all hungry for more awareness of God in our life. The prayer exam of the church has done for thousands of years for just that reason. Another simple prayer practice that um, some people really love is incorporating a simple thing, which is a breath prayer with the Jesus prayer. Traditionally, the church called the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. And sometimes where our minds are so scattered or anxiety is really increasing, a breath prayer where we say words as we breathe out and then finish the statement as we breathe in. <sighs> Lord Jesus Christ, and then a big inhale, have mercy on me, a sinner. And you say that over and over and over again. Now, some of you are like, man, Scott, you're being way too formulaic or legalistic. But I'm telling you, I've had friends say, recommit to these practices to rebuild prayer as a gateway to believing that God will show up in their lives. The final one that I want to share has probably been the most helpful for me. So it's definitely a personal um, kind of an encouragement. I call it, and the church calls it an imagination prayer. I use an app on my phone called the Insight Timer, which 
don't be thrown by it. Some Christians use it and non-Christians, a lot of people use it. I love it for just a, a prayer timer. And sometimes I have 20 minutes. Oftentimes I have 10 or 12 or 15 or whatever. I take whatever time that I've given over to prayer in the mornings and I divide it in half. And I give myself, I'm like, man, I got 10 minutes before my kids are going to be up. Whatever. Oh, I'm going to just take it. There's, you know, it's all good. And the first, whatever, so half of 10, it's five. I'm an English major, but I can do that. I give the first five minutes, it's just my pleading. God, my daughter. God, my wife. God, my church. God, I need peace. Like, but then with this Insight Timer app, I can divide any prayer time in half, and then a bell goes off. And then I force myself in that second half of my imagination prayer to just spend time with God. And I imagine myself in a space that feels sweet to me. For me, I'm a boat person, so I imagine myself in a boat with Jesus. And the only rule that I have is that I can't talk except these words, Jesus, what do you want to say to me today? Most times he doesn't say anything. But in that silence, even that five minutes, my heart is being rewired that time in prayer isn't just constant pleading or absence or critique. Sometimes I need to just be with God. Again, I gave you five, and if I, we went around and you shared kind of what's working for you in prayer, you'd have five others. So the idea isn't like anyone being judged or graded or whatever, but there is an encouragement. Remember, Jesus gave us this story that we would always pray and never give up. There's a lot of options for us as Christians, but it's not optional to not pray. Again, no judgment, pure invitation. So if you're in a season where it's like, I'm just not praying a lot, I just want to encourage you, like, come back into the prayer practice. This story is meant to do that. And Jesus is going to, in just a moment, get into the things that some people are much more comfortable articulating faith as, things like justice and doing the right thing. We're talking about that too. But we can't go too fast to not say... Like, we need to be people of prayer. Isaiah 62, this verse 6 and 7, is this great encouragement about what prayer is, where the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 62, I've posted watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem. They'll never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. Isn't that beautiful? It just, we're meant to be people of prayer. And I don't know if it's any solace, but... I'm a professional Christian. I get, pay, I get paid to be a Jesus follower. And I'll go through like, oh my gosh, it's been a week and I haven't done my prayer practices. I got so busy doing ministry or doing life that I missed the chance to just be with the Father who loves me so. And then we're invited to come back and tomorrow morning set my timer and spend time with them. So I don't know where God is encouraging you, but I know for a lot of people, prayer gets difficult because we're not sure of the connection between my prayers and the movements of a holy God. I already shared with you, and sorry, you know, just kind of, it hits me in moments. I can share like benignly, like, yeah, 13 years ago, we lost our sons. Like, that was the worst of the worst. There was a year of grief and loss and trauma and counseling. And uh, so the connection between a God who is just and the pain of people, it's a tension I really feel. And the call to always pray and never give up, or as Jesus would say in Matthew, you know, ask and it'll be given to you, knock, and be, you know, that ask, knock, seek, it's, we question that. I, I prayed for this person and they were still sick. I prayed for this job, which God, it would have been good, and it didn't, like, we can all name a ton of places we've prayed and pleaded and it didn't turn out. So how do, we, how do we deal with that tension? I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna belittle your faith and try to give you an answer to that. I am gonna invite you into that tension that Jesus told this story and a woman did see her pleading eventuate into justice. I will just name for you that from my vantage point, working with six churches, a big staff, thousands of people part of our community, I know a lot of people are praying in ways that don't get answered, but I do hear incredible praise reports where people pray and lives are changed. And I have no formulas. This, this is not a formula sermon. I can't tell you when things change and not change. But I do know, like this widow, we're meant to continue to plead, even when we don't know what's taking so long. I'll tell you a story to illustrate this. At Bethany North, where my wife and I helped start 12 years ago, we've never had a building even as sweet as this. We've been in schools and community centers and 
been really difficult. And again, that theology of loss that I mentioned, just, just in December, we had made this gorgeous 15,000 square foot space that was going to be so sweet for kids. We have hundreds of kids in our church. It had putt-putt golf. It was a former family fun center. Putt-putt golf, batting cages, huge spaces. Two weeks before it opened, electrical fire. It all, all burns. And the building deemed total loss. I'm like, what, God? Like, so we have to wrestle with, like, there's real lament when God acts in such a way or doesn't act in such a way that's contrary to us. But a story to illustrate how sometimes waiting and trusting God, even when we can't see what he's doing, we're meant to have faith in that kind of waiting game, is um, Bethany North didn't have a space to worship, and we needed both an office and a worship space. And there, some of you know this story, so just humor me. Some of you don't know the story, but it's a sweet story. There was an old strip club on Aurora in Shoreline. It was called Sugars. It was seized by the federal government. They were doing awful things out of that building. And when the government found out, they, they, you know, people went to jail, are still in jail. They you know, seized the building. It went into probate for several years. A local businessman bought the building and uh, it's right near Shorewood High School. So he wanted to do something more positive with it. Bethany North, the church I was passing at the time, needed a worship space. This didn't foot the bill. But as we prayed for it, we knew that we needed to act and do something with this building. We're like, we still don't have a Sunday gathering, so we have to set up speakers and chairs and all these things. But this building needs a new home. So what if we made a coffee shop and our offices out of this space? And we stepped in, and we rented it, and then we renovated it. We had one coffee vendor that remade the front of the house into a coffee shop. They sold their business. It's now called Black Coffee Northwest that rents space from the church. And they have this multi-ethnic, really beautiful coffee shop and doing great things for people of color and in our community. And then we rented the back. And then about two years ago, we weren't even using it during COVID. So Black Coffee Northwest just took over the whole building. And the church subsidizes a small part of the building uh, to support their mission, and then they use it. But when we finished that project, and it was, I mean, it's a long story. I don't have time to tell you the whole thing. But, like, I mean, the mirrors was, were still up. And you go into the, um, you know, the carpet, this, like, red, nasty, nasty carpet. And um, it really, from the time the federal government took over the strip club, like, they had pulled out things of value, but there were still refrigerators in there and, and the booths and you know, like the remnants of the strip club. And you could feel the enemy's presence. It just felt like darkness. And you walk into certain corners of the building, and like horrible things happened here, you, like without a shadow of a doubt. So we started to pray and pray over every corner of the building and then tear things down and punch windows in. And it was this very powerful, this is probably eight years ago, very powerful time for us, the worshiping community, this mix of praying and acting that real faith is, prayer and justice. And... You know, we finished the whole thing and grand opening, all this is going on. And the kind of North End pastors were having a prayer meeting and they invited me to come and tell the story. So oftentimes we know just a part of the story. I knew my part of the story. I didn't know the whole story. So I told my part of the story and there's like a hundred people there to pray and different churches present, whatever. And I was very proud of what our volunteers had done and whatnot. I told my part of the story of how God had called us to not just pray, but to pray and act and renovate this building. And then at the end of the meeting, this woman comes up to me and she was dazed. And she said, I was part of a mom's group that we used to walk that strip club every week we would walk, we would see the young people going in and out. We knew horrible things were happening there. We would walk that building every week, and we'd walk that neighborhood, and we'd pray on God to move, and we'd get on our knees, and she has me like in the palm of her hand. I'm like, oh, yeah, what happened next? She's like, we stopped praying. We just, we wondered what was taking so long. Something about her retelling me that story in her mind's eye, they had given up because God hadn't heard their prayers somehow. She couldn't see the end of the story. And then when she told, you know, where Bethany's part of it, it's still very much an ongoing story and an imperfect story. So I don't mean to tell it as easy, but it's helpful for those of us that get tired of waiting and waiting on God for specific ways we want him to act. The widow in this story is a hero, a shero of sorts, because she doesn't give up. And we're meant to be people that pray, that believes that God changes things. Prayer really matters. And then the second thing that matters from this story is about justice. 
that we are meant as Christians to be moving into the margins in order to set people free. To set people free to be not just people of prayer, but people of prayer and justice, that intersection. If you look at verse 4 from Luke 18, for some time the judge refused, and finally the judge says to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I'll see that she gets justice, so she won't eventually come and attack me. And then Jesus said, Listen to what that unjust judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? Jesus ends his story with three kind of rhetorical questions, which is a very powerful way of storytelling. And so the thing about this judge, not God in the picture, not God at all, doesn't fear God. We don't know what's going on in this judge's life, but this judge has lost all sense of his own identity. He's no longer obedient to God or caring for others. In first century Israel, a judge was meant to serve God and care for others. And so you just kind of as a curious person in the story, like what happened to that judge to make him so bitter that he was going to work every day but didn't care anymore about the people he was serving? He was going to work every day but didn't care for the God because the courts and the church were one in those days. Care for the God he was serving. And I think there's kind of a word there of invitation, not necessarily conviction, but for some of us that feel like it's really hard to go to work right now, or we're like wondering if our work matters or what's our calling. Like, it's a sub point to the story for sure, but like what happened in this judge to make him unjust? The young man that went into that judge duty, I could only imagine, wanted to do the right thing. And how often... Like, life breaks us down, wears us down. I'm not painting him as the victim in the story, but I am asking for some empathy. It's really easy to hear this story, and like, she's good, he's bad, we kind of do that. But I just am curious, like, what happened, what, what happened for him to just make him kind of give up? There's an invitation through this story to believe that our work matters and to be reclaiming the reality that, that when we suffer in our work, that it can make us feel like our work doesn't matter, and then we can become, in ways, the unjust judge. But the faith of this woman kind of wakes him up, changes him. The, I don't like the NIV translation, like, she'll come and attack me. The Greek word is this hypopiaze, which means better translation is, she's exhausting me. She's making me black and blue by her persistence. And so again, remember what I just said, prayer, it changes things. We don't often know how. And there is a thing when we talk about justice, and this is the point of the story, that we're, we are meant as God's people to be like a good judge, stepping in where we can to lend our voices. There's things with the prophetic voice that can seem attacking at times or violent. I know for me, at times, the case of racial reconciliation, where it's the voices often at the margins who are saying, like, it can't be like this. The church has got to wake up. Leadership's got to change. And in that regard, there's kind of this invitation, those of us in the room, like, oh, I have authority in my job or in my relationships. I have agency. Yes, there's systemic things that I don't know how to change, but every one of us has an opportunity to impact for justice. We can get worn down like that judge that just kind of gave up and just feel like, you know, does it matter anymore? Like driving home through Seattle last night and seeing the tents again and feeling after a few days away that sense of loss, that we are meant to be change makers. Again, God is not the judge. 1 Peter 2.23, Jesus entrusts himself to the God who judges justly. No, our God is a God, Jesus says, who knows how to be good to his people. Jesus would say in Luke 11.13, if you are evil, know how to give good gifts, how much more will your generous father respond? But for those of us that are like, okay, I want to be a Christian, that means the story says I've got to pray and I've got to act. I've got to be a person that's hearing the voice of marginalized people. I've got to be a person of justice. As one theological thinker, this guy Nicholas Lash says, the fundamental form of Christian interpretation of scripture is the activity of the believing community. The fundamental form of our interpretation of the Bible is the activity of those of us that call ourselves the believing community of the church. This means that we've got to be people who think different, who feel different, who behave different. The world is changed by people who are hearing the word of God and putting it into action. 
that we would be people of activity. And again, what I, remember I said earlier that I see a lot of faith people and communities that are like, are you going to be a prayer person or are you going to be an action person? And I love wrapping the parable series up with this story because it's like, we really need to be both. We've got to be people that are intimate with God. How? Prayer. But if we're just praying and not trying to do justice when we see people marginalized, like this woman who's twice victimized, so as you just kind of think, I want to encourage you, let this message stay with you in the week ahead. Like, okay, where am I like the widow? What hurts? How do I bring that to God? Where have I been wronged? Where have I been victim? Where am I the judge? Where do I need to just reclaim my calling in my vocation? Or my calling as a Christian to be a person of justice? We can't do all the things, but we can do some things, right? And I do think that what the church needs more than anything else right now is a group of Christians that are recommitted to living our faith in powerful ways. My son, who's 16, is very much in this, um, let's call it a formation phase, a great kid, but, you know, like goes to church on Sundays, and then he's at public school on Mondays, and just like, okay, how do we live out this life of faith? And um, I'm careful to try to tell as many stories as sermons at him. Pastor's kid's pretty difficult, right? And the biggest thing I'm trying to do is that my life represents the sermons I give, imperfectly. But for all of us, it's not sermons that change. It's our stories, the life we live. And it was about a week, a little more than a week ago, and we were going to Chipotle. He loves Chipotle. We all love Chipotle. And there's a guy in the parking lot. He's got a sign. He's asking for money. And I just stop. And I don't often stop. I don't certainly don't always stop. But something that day just... Something about being with my son, seeing this hungry man, very hot day. And I said, sir, I, I'm not prepared to give you money today, but I would buy you a meal. He's like, I would love that. S- super simple. Wasn't a long line. It was pretty, you know, it was $11. Went in, big burrito, big drink. Walked back out. I didn't really preach to my son because he was just watching this whole thing. And it was kind of over. We just gave this guy a meal. We go back in. Took 10 minutes and $11. I had 10 minutes that day. I don't always. I had $11. I didn't know. I don't always. We go back in the line to order our food. And this person runs in kind of all frantically. I'm like, hey, man, hey. And I was, like, I was actually kind of scared for a moment because they seemed a tad bit dysregulated, actually. I'm just like, all right, what's happening right now? And you've all been there. Like, He's like, I just saw that whole thing happen. I was actually driving by on 196. It's a very busy road. And I pulled in here, and I needed you to know that, that, that I saw it, and I felt something watching that. And I've been super discouraged on homelessness, and I don't know what to do, but just I needed you to know that that was a big deal for me. I'm like, thank you, you know, like, cool. And then he ran out and got in his car and drove off. And I do think that when we act justly in small ways, it's like pond, you know, rocks into a pond, that like it's like one action, one stone, there's a ton of water, it feels pointless. But if we, as a group, are throwing stones in the pond, like waves get made, lives get changed. Again, really small ways, and there's systemic things that we can't do, but there's personal things that we can do. So Jesus is like, you gotta pray more powerfully, sustain this desire to, to interact with me, and you gotta be a person of justice. That's what real faith is. Verse 8, Luke 18, very powerful verse. I encourage you to pray over it this week. Jesus says in verse 8 of 18, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. That's what God does. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This powerful question. Will he find faith on the earth? Will we hold on to our faith in hard times? Faith is our ability to continue to believe in God despite the forces working against us. Are we holding on? Are we growing in our faith? I mean, there's 12 of us here today. But like if the 12 of us here today are like, yes, yeah, Jesus, you'll find faith. Imperfect faith, but I want to be a person of prayer. I want to be a person of justice. Will you grow my faith? Will you do that together? Will you do that with this little group in West Seattle? i got to believe that God, the good Father, will continue to act and move in such a way that draws people closer to himself. Our faith is often eroded because we don't know where God is working, because of our pain or because of the distance from our prayers and God's movement. 
because there's things in our work, our family lives that just feel like, I don't know how you're moving right now, God. But this is meant to be this pep talk from the Lord Jesus Christ to be people of faith, to keep believing, keep growing, keep, yes, I agree, Woods, keep praying, keep acting, keep persevering. And if like we did one by one, like, all right, we're gonna do breakouts now, 15 minutes of time, come tell me what hurts, tell me where you feel like the widow, every one of you would have a story. So I don't mean to just be like, hey, go be a good Christian, that's not what this is about. But Jesus gave this story to say, your life of faith really matters. So be encouraged. The Father hears you. The Father loves you. And yeah, there'll be times where you feel like the widow just getting beat up. Keep praying. Keep persevering. I just told this story about like Chipotle. Super simple. One person who's hungry got a burrito. It's the larger stuff in our society that we're often like, does it matter? You know, like how I vote or how I interact. Like, we can think about racial reconciliation, that topic. We can think of homelessness. We can think of environmental degradation. We can think of people leaving the church or leaving faith. These are all these major forces that feel like tectonic plates under it. Like, how do I change a tectonic plate? I can't. I just got to take control of my little patch of ground and trust that God will be the one to kind of shape. But there are times that God knits enough of our personal stories together to enable mass change, to enable mass encouragement. And I think Jesus gave this in Luke 18 to just really, really encourage people that enough of you are just buying Chipotle, enough of you throwing stones in the water, enough of you are praying and believing God will act. This is actually how the kingdom of God is brought about. And so I'll just share with you kind of a good news. We need good news, right? Good news email that got in my inbox this week about some change makers up in my community in the North End. It's an anti-racism group, activists, some from Christian communities, not enough, namely. I don't want to claim this as a Christian win. Um, but in the hometown of Bethany North of Shoreline. And this is just a neat win of people that were advocating together and how structural systemic racism is being addressed in the city of Shoreline. And uh, over the last few years, some stories were getting out of what was called driving while black in Shoreline. And that many citizens in Shoreline felt like there was a systemic issue with people who were people of color being targeted and given more tickets and discrimination at the hands of police. And so a group of change makers, some Christian, many not, went to the city. They went, met with the city manager. They met with the interim police chief of Shoreline. They started doing research on parking and speeding tickets given as far back as 2013, and some kept praying. And then last week, a email got sent from Shoreline City Manager Debbie Terry, and I'm quoting the email shared with this anti-racism group in Shoreline. She says, at our June meeting, I committed that we would publicly acknowledge a part of the report that the data you showed us shows that black individuals have been disproportionately ticketed in Shoreline. And we acknowledge this has caused disproportionate harm to our black community members. The interim police chief and I, the city manager, are committed to taking steps to change this trend. And we recognize and continue to follow some of the policies and, and practices would just reinforce the historical complicity in maintaining and perpetuating structural racism. We will hold, hold ourselves accountable to review future ticketing data. They've committed to, to different trends and changing the disproportionality towards um, ticketing black individuals in Shoreline. Now, that, that was super encouraging for me to see that a group of people, concerned citizens, like, I think something's going on, and I think we need to raise our voice, and that there was a victory into what feels like a structural problem in my hometown. I also will confess to you, as I read through the emails on the distribution list, I wish I would have seen more at churchbcc.org at shorelinefellowship.com, at calvinlutheran. It wasn't a lot of that. It was a lot of Google and Comcast. But I knew some of the names to know they're people of faith, a couple of really strong Christians. But I am hoping in the season ahead that we become a church that knows how to pray and get on our face as never before and knows how to act, that we would be judged rightly by a Father God saying, this is a group of people bringing justice on the earth so that when Jesus comes, 
He won't say, will I find faith? He'll say, well done, good and faithful ones. You had real faith. You prayed. You acted. You believed. That's the church of the future that I want to be part of. And I know it's very much your legacy out here. I came to encourage you today to meet you and, and to keep going, keep running the good race. I'm going to uh, invite Caitlin up. We're going to end with just a time of prayer together. Uh, before we do that, let me just pray. Jesus, thank you so much for this message. Thank you for this simple and convicting little story, God. And we know there's lots of entry points to our own lives about prayer, about justice, about vocation, about our woundedness. We know that all of us have been impacted differently by the telling of the story, but God, we just invite you now as we close in prayer, as we close in worship, that we would be thinking about our lives, about where you want us to pray, not just like as a theory, but time with you tomorrow or Wednesday afternoon. And God, that we would be a church here in West Seattle, across all of our locations, other Christians outside of Bethany, really moving into the margins for people on the sake of justice. That they would say, look at these Christians, look how they love, look how they cared for the widows, for those that were with adversaries, for those that were beat up and bruised and bloodied. They continued to believe that faith changed things. Jesus, we would ask that you would help our faith come alive that our faith would wake up, that our faith would grow. We ask God for 100 people in this room six weeks from now, that people would come back to church to keep hearing stories of faith and prayer and justice, that you would start a movement through Bethany, West Seattle, that would impact every neighborhood here in West Seattle. We love you, God. In your name we pray. Amen. So as we close, I know you guys have a practice of just kind of taking a moment and having some space. We're going to give you that in just a moment. Um, but I thought what we could do together is prayer, uh, pray together the prayer of St. Francis that's called the Peace Prayer of St. Francis. I think we have it here. And we're going to just say it together, and then Caitlin's going to give you some space to just be with God in whatever way you need to pray and be with God, and then she's going to lead us out in worship. So let's, let's read this together as a prayer. This is the Peace Prayer of St. Francis. Lord... Make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen.
all stand together and close out uh, with these last couple worship songs.
Thank you guys. That was really pretty. Thanks, yeah, Scott. Let me pray. Jesus. And thank you, Scott, for being here today yeah. to encourage us. Oh, yeah. Um, let me pray. Jesus, thanks so much uh, for just that really simple closing that we want more of your spirit to fall on us and we're to declare that you are great and you are faithful. And in that longing and that waiting, God, teach us to, to wait and believe that you're moving. God, help our faith increase. Uh, help our prayers increase. Help our justice increase. God, may we not leave this place discouraged or feeling shame, but invitation to next steps, to partner with you, to experience more of your life and our life. We love you, God. In your name we pray. Amen. One little announcement before the benediction. There's a tradition here of walking to Highland Park Corner Store. So if anyone wants to do that, whatever you normally do, meeting out on the corner or whatever, that's a really cool thing you guys do. So that's happening today for anyone that can make it. And now receive your benediction. You are the people of God living the story. So may you pray and partner with God in just ways and believe that your faith is changing the lives of others and your own. May your faith grow in the season ahead. Thanks for having me. It's good to be with you guys. Go in the grace of God.